Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Christian for organizing this, this workshop, this conference on Rwanda. Uh, my name is Luc Redams, and um, I am an international lawyer by training. And um, I my research on Rwanda uh, started with doing an internship of six months in 1998 at the uh, ICTR in Arusha. And for, for a couple of years, I basically published case notes. I would write up uh, the, um, the proceedings um, against Genocidaire in Switzerland, in Belgium, in France. So outside Rwanda, this was related to my, uh, to my uh, thesis, my, my, my first book uh, called Universal Jurisdiction, International and Municipal Legal Perspective, Perspectives. Um, so that's how I started on Rwanda. And then by the mid-2000s, when you got drawn into Gacha Cha, I, I moved on to other things. I moved on through the history of humanitarian law, through transnational social movements, and a book on international prosecutors, the, the various international tribunals, and, 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 and the institution, the office of the prosecutor. That was my focus. And by 2010, I got uh, my, I uh, became interested again in Rwanda for two reasons. First was the impunity of the RPF. By then, it was clear that uh, that the last prosecutor of the tribunal would not uh, would not uh, issue indictments. Uh, so RPF impunity, and second, uh, the decisions, the judgments of um, of the ICTR. Uh, Appeals chamber often that questioned that 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 questioned the dominant narrative. The, the dominant narrative of the conflict started crumbling. Uh, this idea that, that there was a conspiracy uh, long in the making, and so um, I started wondering. I started wondering what can explain RPF impurity, mm -hmm. and I identified two reasons. That's its alliance with the United States, and a bit later also with the UK. So I investigated that relationship between the RPF and the United States in, an, in a long, long <coughs> article, Let's Be Friends. Let's be friends. Uh, this was the United States telling the new government, let's be friends. Eh? Uh, things, didn't, things were ugly, but let's be friends. How can we help you? And uh, so an accidental uh, alliance, an accidental partnership, I should say. So no conspiracies there. I don't believe in, in, uh, in an Anglo-Saxon conspiracy to expand, uh, ang to expand the uh, Anglo-Saxon sphere of influence in, in Africa. Uh, second explanation was, so you had the alliance with the United States, and second explanation is for me this powerful narrative of what happened in 1994. A narrative of, of conspiracy and narrative of international community bystanders. And I said, where does this narrative come from? And that led me almost accidentally to that, to that paper, uh, NGO Justice, African Rights as Pseudo-Prosecutor of the Rwandan Genocide. I recognized in the book uh, of African Rights the, the the language the, uh, used by the RPF, almost sometimes literally, um, in press releases uh, from, uh, from from press releases during the war, and somehow they got into that book, but without acknowledging any sort. So, what was that relationship between African rights and that NGO and the RPF? So that's that became that article, that um, yeah, that uh, uh, was for which I received a lot of pushback also by the friends of Rwanda uh, who, will, who may be watching this presentation eh, after it goes online. So uh, I, I, I want to say to them, uh, I appreciate your fact checking as long as you uh, quote me correctly or you don't, uh, as long as you don't quote me 
uh, out, uh, outside of context. And finally, I want to say um, there's no need to send your complaints to my employer or my sponsors. They don't read it. They just throw it away. Okay. Um, now, with this work in progress with, with a colleague in Paris, Roland Tissot, um, I, I um, joined uh, Cyan and uh, also um, Jens in talking about the, what, what is the missing narrative. And you, you said something interesting between, uh, about a correlation between um, gachacha activity, eh? high activity correlates with high concentration of young, um, of, uh, young Hutu un unmarried men uh, in a region. Mm. Interesting observation. Uh, Jens, um, you talked about um, the lawfare as a substitute for the regular warfare, which became too expensive eh, after the Second Congo uh, War. So, and then gacha cha um, So lawfare um, replaces uh, brute violence, mm -hmm. brutal violence. So that's where uh, my, uh, again, an accidental discovery uh, comes in, just like with uh, with F the link between African rights and uh, the RPF during the war. Hidden violence, Rwanda's male deficit after the 1994 war and genocide. Um, yes, this paper, this paper go, uh, um, goes into um, the, the question of numbers and um, question has been there, hot water, it's very sensitive, it's very, it's very controversial, how many died, how many Tutsi died, how many, how many Hutu died, the thing is we will never be able to tell, correct, uh, exactly, that's just impossible. But there is one thing that we can tell, and that is the excessive male mortality, we can tell how many more males died than females. And that's a clue to understanding that if to understanding hidden violence between 1994 and 1998. The question is who was behind that hidden violence? And that's where uh, I will be talking about. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm sure some of you have worked or are familiar with um, the uh, reports of the general population and housing censuses of Rwanda. Uh, Christian, you must have looked, studied them mm -hmm, for insights, uh, to, get, to get any possible insights about the mass violence and mass migration in and out in the mid, and, and mid and second half of the 1990s. So um, in, right in the middle of, uh, of, of, of one intercensal period, 1991-2002. So we have a baseline here, and then we have a new census. Eh? So uh, four years after uh, the end of the mass violence and the mass migration. But we, not only that, we have also 19 to look at we, uh, 1978 census and the 2012 census. Here we can look for confirmation of what was of, of the census of, what, of the results of, uh, of 2002. So we have, we have good data to work with and the period of mass violence and mass migration falls right in the middle. You are familiar, Christian, as I am you too, uh, maybe, mm -hmm. Jens, maybe, with RP, RGPH3, Recensement General de la Population et de l'Habitat. Uh, that's the abbreviation still used in Rwanda of 2002. Um, interestingly, but understandably, the authors of the report, which are international people, mostly, um, from 
the United States Population Fund, uh, from uh, a demo dem demographic research center in, uh, in Yaoundé. Mm -hmm. they, they do not uh, make any estimates about the death toll of the mid-1990s. They stay clear from that. That's, they, they, don't, they didn't want to go there. I talked or I emailed with the, the lead uh, author of the report not our business. So genocide and war is mentioned only spor very sporadically in the narrative report uh, of 2002. But interestingly, or they point out that there is an acute male deficit due to the war and genocide. An acute male deficit to, due to the war and genocide. Well, that's what you expect eh? after war. Not necessarily after genocide, no, not at all. But after war, yes. Um, you would expect a male deficit. Look at France after the First World War. Look at uh, the Soviet Union after the Second World War. Acute male deficit in certain age groups. Um, third, third, um, observation about RGP, RGPH3 is no longer any mention of ethnicity. It was abolished in 1996. So you may ask, um, if there is no ethnicity, and this is normal male deficit, so what, are, what, what, do, you claim to have what do you claim to have discovered? Um, what? <laughs> How can you possibly uh, provide us, how, how can, how can to, uh, this um, census possibly provide us insight into violence, into hidden violence in the mid-1990s? The acute male deficit due to the war and genocide, scholars have accepted that without questioning the link between them. And, and, you, and, and it makes perfect, it's, it sounds so, uh, so self-evident, yet that you don't ask questions until you start thinking about, hey, genocide means that you kill indiscriminately. One. Almost, mostly, yes, yes, second. You, you realize that the surviving population <coughs> of Tutsi, and I take this, the, the figure of De Forge, 150,000, it doesn't matter too much whether it was 150 or 200,000 mm -hmm. or more, that that surviving population is very small to impact, to create an acute male deficit on a population of 8 million in 2002. So you sense already that the genocide cannot be, cannot explain the acute male deficit. Second, if you are, if you studied a, a little, say a little bit the conflict from 1990 to 1998, civil war, and then uh, insurgency, Counterinsurgency in the Northwest. You have done that, Christian, yes. But then you pay attention to, to the military fatalities, to the combat fatalities. And then if you read something about uh, the Rwanda Civil War, it will say low intensity conflict for, for, for all the people who died there. Hundreds of, hundreds of thousands, or maybe a million or more. Mm -hmm. It was in military speak, milit in, in conflict language, a low, a, a low intensity conflict, which means less than X number of combat fatalities per year. Altogether, I, I will come to the figure, 14,000, 15,000. And the most deadly period was, in fact, the counterinsurgency in the Northwest. So, yeah, we have 
14, 15,000 young men, eh, men missing mm -hmm, in that war. Then genocide, okay, indiscriminately, uh, not completely, but a very small group, a very small surviving population of, oh, see? So for these two factors to impact the sex ratio, the, the numbers of males per female from 0 0.95 of, for the overall population to 0 0.91 in 2002, that raises questions. 15,000 plus um, some more, eh, some more Tutsi men than women killed cannot bring down the, uh, the overall uh, sex ratio of a population of eight million. Then it becomes more. In, then it becomes it becomes really interesting when you start studying the age groups. You look at the, at the tables in the census report. The the age sex structure of the population. Dramatic decline of the sex ratio in age group in um, uh, 21 and 40, thir uh, 13, 42 in 1994. So uh, adolescents and uh, young, young adults. There we see decline of from uh, nine, uh, 0 0.97 in 1991 to 0 0.87 in 2002. What does this suggest? What do these data suggest? There's two possibilities. Um, high mortality or high out-migration. Okay? That they let, went, went to the Congo or, or to Tanzania uh, of military age males. Because in the, so in, out migra in, in the years after 1994, these, these, these these boys became military age male, so you could argue that they uh, that they left, or they were. You could say they were in jail. Mm -hmm. That was a, re a response I got from a very knowledge knowledgeable person about Rwanda just last week. He said that, look, you are missing. Okay, you are missing one hundred thousand. These are the one hundred thousand that were in jail. Mm -hmm. No, because. Uh, censuses um, are conducted to, uh, using international standards. They have institutional households, and which include the army and the prisons. And you look at the, at the, at the number of people in the institutional households in 1991 and 2002, then you see that they had not overlooked the prison population and the higher army population in 2002 than in 1991. So, no, they were included. Um, you may say, well, young people, eh, or they, they haven't settled. The, for the parents, they don't live at home anymore. Uh, so the parents, so when, there is an, uh, when the census takers uh, knock on the door, then they say, oh, they don't live here anymore. Or the parents may, be, may, may have been afraid of telling that, uh, that, that the, the young sons were uh, living there, afraid that the information would be used for something else. So not, so, so hiding their presence from the census takers. Mm -hmm. Could be. But importantly, <coughs> the 2012 census shows that the deficit in those age groups is permanent. So it's a, it's a structural deficit that moves up, that moves up in the age pyramid. So they were missing in 2002, and when 10 years later, they had not shown up again. Not by coming back from, from the Congo, not because they had settled or so. No, they are 
permanently missing. Before we go any further, because I'm going to make some strong claims here, so I better be sure to answer a pre preliminary, preliminary question. That is, okay, if you, um, you, want, you have detailed calculations and you will claim that in the end that 100,000 young males are missing, have disappeared simply, and Hutu moreover. Uh, that's, a, that's a serious accusation, a serious allegation can you, are the, the demographic data reliable enough? Because of, after all, Rwanda is a third world country. Hmm? Well, Rwanda is an exception among third world countries. It's an exception in sub-Saharan African countries. Its demographic data are considered among the most reliable in Africa. Why? Because of the size of the country, very small. The population of 8 million, 10 million, is not big. The culture, the culture of obedience, culture of top-down bureaucratic governance, one single language, the use of one language. So that makes, it, that's, that makes Rwanda exceptional in Africa. And moreover, a census, a general census, is really is a, is a semi-military is conducted in, in, with the cooperation from the military and the police. It's locked down, 24 hours. You, no one goes to work. You stay inside. Stay inside your house. And 12,000, 12,000 or 16,000, the 12,000 is from the Gachacha, census takers, all trained, uh, go knock on the doors. It's conducted with technical, substantial technical assistance and supervision from international agencies. Peter Juven writes, the results are considered extremely reliable, precise up to the last person. Anyway, they are additional after census quality control checks with, with, with some correction. So it's a, it's, they do a very good job and we so we believe we can use uh, the, the, uh, the census data for uh, for our argument now the so what the 2002 census doesn't cannot tell us is how many people were killed uh, in 94 uh, or thereafter um, because too much time passed from 1994 to 2002, um, there wasn't there was the in-migration of 500 up 500,000, 600,000 Tutsi from the diaspora. There was the out-migration of um, initially uh, up to two million uh, Hutu. So. Um, Impossible to, you can only speculate. There were 7.5, 7.8 million in 1994. Take, if you take an average annual growth rate of 3%, should have been 10 million in 2002. There were only 8 million. So 2 million people are missing. That does not mean that they were killed. No, some, some of them were never born because their, and the parents were killed. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. So, but we can uh, quantify um, the, the male deficit. We can calculate how many males we should have found in each age group. The eight, in, 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 uh, among, the, among, the, uh, among the popul among the age groups before 1994. So step one is we apply the normal sex ratio from the 1991 census to each five-year cohort, 11 years later. 
So, um, and then, so the expect, expected number of males in 2002 is the number of females in 2002 multiplied by the sex ratio of 1991. And then we subtract the number of males in each group from what that number would have been if the sex ratio of 1991 had applied. This is some, so I'm not a quantitative guy, but this is something I could do myself. And um, then, so we, then we arrive at 191,000 uh, men aged 21 or older uh, or missing. So this means 191,000 more men than women missing in the, in the, um, in 2002. It doesn't say that 191,000 men have disappeared or um, in total or, or, or been killed in total, no. It says this is about excessive male mortality, more male more males dying than females. When I had this number, I wrote a draft of my paper, sent it to Rwanda experts, colleagues, and I said, okay, this is, this is my rough calculation. I'm not a quantitative guy. I need help. And I was put in contact with Roland Tissot in Paris. He's a independent scholar, He's a, he teaches at a, at a lycée, he's a historian, he, he has, I think, the, one of the, 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 great, the biggest uh, uh, personal libraries with, with Rwanda material, and he understands demographics very well. He, had all the, he has at home all the, um, the, the reports from the colonial era, everything at home, and it's in his head also. I asked him, um, I sent this to him, and he said, you're onto something. You are definitely onto something, uh, but we have to refine. Because we have to account for the general and permanent gender imbalance in the Rwandan population. Okay, that's the second step. Um, because males die anyway earlier than females, so he does this calculation, and, um, and then we, we are, so it decreases the number of missing males to 158,000. The third step is we have to go back from 2002. This is 158 missing males in 2002. But how many were missing? in 1994, 1995, because some of them, of those, um, that population was higher. Eh? Every year, eh? that is mortality. Mm -hmm. So that population uh, was, was higher in, in, uh, on, on January 1st, 1995, right? So, he, then he accounts for the survival rate of the Rwandan population between 1994 and 2002. This is assuming that most of these males went missing, disappeared in 1994, which I'm not sure, sure about. But we, we assume that that's the case. It, it may have happened later. It may have happened when they returned from Congo and when they were, when they were bused to their villages that they uh, disappeared uh, after the repatriation on their way home. So then the deficit goes up again, um, accounting for the survival rate to 173,000, age 13 plus in 1994. Again, I repeat, this is not about absolute mortality, this is relative mortality of males compared to females. Now, so what? Mm -hmm. 
What's the point? We expect that more males die, die in mass violence than females because the males or the violent ones, so they are also targeted. And so sounds, until now, sounds, there's nothing controversial that more males die, die in, died in those violent, in, the, in that violent period than females. And there are no ethnic categories in, uh, anymore in 2002. So how can you then go any further? Well, we can establish the ethnicity of the 173,000 excess missing males by using fairly precise approximations of war deaths and sex ratio of the surviving Tutsi population. So here it is. War, combat deaths, military deaths, very few, 12 to 14,000. And so we have to, we will deduct that from. So, so the war, the war in the strict sense accounts for less than 10%, 12 to 14,000, less than 10% of the 173,000 missing males. Five minutes only, Chris? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Second, genocide. Okay, it may or may not affect the sex ratio of a population. Assuming that 150,000 Tutsi survived, and then using an official survivor count, we know that 58% that of the survivors were women, 42% were men, then we, we we, we apply the normal sex ratio that should have, that, that we should have found in that population, the pre-genocide sex ratio, then we arrive at 20,000 more Tutsi males than females killed in 1994. So, 20,000 plus 5,000 RPF battle deaths. They won the war, so we assume that they had less casualties than the, than the defeated enemy. So Tutsi account for 25,000, more or less, of the missing males, and Hutu necessarily for the remaining 148,000. So male deficit in, in 1995, so after the war and genocide, 173,000. Hutu, 148,000. Tutsi, 20,000. Tutsi military, that's 5,000. Excessive male mortality. Keep that in mind. Now, what, what are the causes of the, uh, what may be the causes of the Hutu male deficit of 148,000? Well, military fatalities, mm -hmm. 8 to 10,000. Intra-Hutu violence, here there's an interesting point. There, so much is said about intra-Hutu uh, violence, claiming the lives of, of 10,000, hundreds of thousands. Um, but then if you start checking the literature, that is, the intra-Hutu violence is not discussed. No. Massacres, they, they were not, intra-Hutu violence was targeted for the individual, either because you were a moderate mm -hmm, or you had property. Moderates, they were not hundreds of thousands of moderates or tens of thousands. Moderates were some politicians, some local officials who, who opposed, who who had publicly taken position against the genocide, mm -hmm. against the government. Massacres of moderates, or massacres for this reason, were not prosecuted by the ICTR either. Only selected 
uh, only targeted assassinations. So I, I wonder how much um, died in Indra Hutu violence. But one thing is sure, given the profile of those missing, the age, they were not moderates. They were too young to have any opinion. They didn't speak out. They kept what they thought for themselves. In. They had no position of authority in the community to be considered politically relevant. Second, they had no property, too young. They cannot have been killed for their property or for their, for their ideology of, of opposing genocide. But still, we will allow very generously for five to 10,000 more Hutu men than, killed, than women killed in intra-Hutu violence. Out-migration. In 2002, the census of 2002, at that moment there were 15,000 FDLR troops in the Congo. We deduct that, that them from the 148,000. Even though we know that they, were for, they had 40,000 dependents. 40,000 dependents, wives, girls, friends, children. So there may not have been a an, an gender imbalance there. But the, the reply will be from people who, who read our, our, our stuff, hey, FDLR, that's where they were. So we deduct them. Refugees. Um, at the time, 120 to 130,000 registered with UNHCR. That's August 2002. You got a minute, man. Sorry? You got a minute. But interestingly, UNHCR has also sex ratios for the, for the refugee population. And there is no male surplus. Contrary to what you may expect, there is no male surplus among the registered of, uh, uh, refugees. Then, prison deaths, yes, we know that, 10,000. Mm -hmm. um, and 11,000 in total, deduct 5% deduct women, that's 10,000 men. Mm -hmm. So, causes of the Hutu male deficit, prison, 10,000. That's an absolute figure. This is um, a relative figure, this is a relative figure, this is a relative figure, this is an absolute figure. We deduct that from the 148 uh, missing males and we are left with, uh, with between 93,000 and 105,000 or so, say 100,000 missing males. Now, this is last slide. Last slide. 40% of them were teens and young adults, were between 13 and 22 in 1994. Too young to own property or hold positions of authority to, to, be, to have been killed in intra-Hutu violence, but old enough to, to be suspected of being members of the inter um, militia. But more importantly, I think they were the generation from which any future Hutu opposition or resistance would be drafted. Then go back to 1994, September, October, UNHCR report, RPF massacring Hutu, reducing the population of Hutu males. Okay, hmm, that's, that, that was the policy. Don't push it, don't push that button. <laughs> no. <laughs> But then if you think about it, this, uh, something happened like that in Burundi, 1972, where the Tutsi regime eliminated nearly all educated male Hutu, or those who, ha who were receiving an education, who were les le collégiens. The collège is, in Burundi is high school, who were between, between the ages of 15 and 18. 100 to 300,000 to eliminate the future opposition, the future intelligentsia among Hutu. So 
we must consider now yeah, the role of the RPF in the disappearance or at the end we conclude the death of, the, of some 100,000 Hutu males, mostly young, young males in 1994. And I repeat, these are relative numbers of more males than females killed. So 100,000 more Hutu males than Hutu females killed also. So I say this is the first quantitative evidence of hidden violence by the RPF. Thank you for your attention. Well, look, thank you for the presentation. And I think I'm in a better place now to answer your question about how this ties into our Gachacha findings. And we can go back to Jens's kind of point about systematic patterns and tactics of the RPF over time. And I'm convinced by, by your data presentation. And so that would then suggest to me that what we find in our Gachacha numbers are the same kind of systematic fear and concern about a particular age group of the Hutu male population over time by the RPF. So what you're finding is the the targeting and the killing of those of that population at a particular time point. We're saying that 10 years on, uh, again similar to, to Yance's argument, we we were no long you know the RPF is no longer able to systematically target them through violence. Mm -hmm. Have switched to a more lawfare approach, mm -hmm. and we see higher numbers of gachacha as a form of repression and regulation of that population. Mm -hmm. These are not the same people, no, right? No, so, because what no. we're looking at is mm -hmm. a youth bulge mm -hmm. of 18 to 22 year olds. I think we actually go up to 26 in at the year that gachacha is ah. is active, okay. right? Ooh. So this is contemporary oh. fear wow. of the same phenomenon that you find. 10, 20 years later. Oh. That goes back, that's the answer to your question. No, 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 yes, thank you. So you were saying that um, these males were the subject of, of uh, gachacha uh, investigations. Uh, so, so no, so, so, so we're just saying that the prosecution uh, rates uh, uh -huh. of okay. people I accused see. of genocide I crimes, see. which are not necessarily these males, uh -huh those prosecution rates are disproportionately high uh -huh. to the number of violence that communities experience in places where there is a youth bulge. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So I where see. in those communities there are just it's a, it's, a, it's a signal. It's a signal yeah. to these youth. Okay. Okay. So although they were too young to be involved in the genocide. Correct. Correct. So they themselves are not being prosecuted I by Gachacha. It's interesting. Right? It's just mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. communities where there mm -hmm. are these youth bulges, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we find higher levels of, of Gachacha prosecution. Uh -huh which we are interpreting, right, as a signal to those youth about the, the reach of the RPF state and the ability of, um, just show of power, right, a, a, simple, a simple show of repressive Intimidation, strategy. it's control, right. intimidation. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. Is it perhaps a clarification question to tag onto this? Because to make sure that I understand both of you correctly, because if this is the case, that's kind of amazing way of triangulating the various bits. If I understand you correctly, so you basically have shown, um, and you presume, I mean, you, you left implicit where they are, what they did, but I believe you believe probably warfare, physical violence, whatever way, may have well removed some of them from the population. You are suggesting that, so this w could be quantitative evidence of warfare having been used as a strategy of conflict, primarily domestically, what you are indicating with other quantitative data derived differently is, in my argument, the existence of lawfare, basically. And, and, what Bloody we, hell. and the way that this would map on is these are different people. We're not talking yeah. about people, nope. but what, what Luke is saying is that between 94 and 2002, the RPF was concerned about a certain age population of Hutu men, right? And, and they dealt with that through violence, right? So, so that these... I mean, if, if, if we buy Luke's data, right, which I think I, think I want to read the paper, but I'm, I'm compelled by, um, that those people were, were killed, were pushed out, were, um, fell to bad ends, right? And then what Christian and, and, and Priam and I are finding is that 10 or 15 years later, 
the RPF continues to be concerned about 18 to 24 or 26 year old, however we do the cutout, um, age Hutu men for their potential to destabilize the regime. We're now no longer killing them. We've moved on. And these are the areas where Gachacha is the strongest. The response from the state around Gachacha is the strongest. The prosecution numbers are the highest. So this would be the this is exactly first what you are saying. This is exactly what you're saying. So one of the one of the concerns of the regime, right? One of the yeah, one of the this is this is fascinating, right? So and it's just probably one of the many things that that, that the RPF is concerned about. But and and this is not unique to the RPF, right? We, there's an entire literature on youth bulges. Yeah. States are, are consistently concerned about unmarried 18 to 24 year old men. Right? You could tie all three together. Good and job, Christian. Integrate qualitative. Way to move the whole field forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I'm convinced. I mean, I don't understand the statistical bit behind, but of course, you guys can. Related to that. I'm like, help me understand how your piece is different from Verputin's one, Detecting Hidden Violence. From who? From? Oh, it's completely different. Yeah, I'm like, how is it different? Because like, it seems like you all are using similar data and a similar approach. No, 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 no. OK, then help me no, understand the difference. No. She, uh, she, she studies hidden violence in the, in the Northwest, eh? correct? No, no, no. This, yes. is, this is for the whole country. This is the piece in political geography. Well, are the findings different? What, um, no, no, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm now on the spot trying to remember what she did and trying to remember what he did. But um, this table, it shows the whole country. She's got values for Butari, all the, all the provinces, difference ranking, estimated 1994 death, death rate, population, yeah, I mean, across I'm, different. I'll push back on both of the titles. I'm not convinced the violence was hidden. No, that's a, no, in, when indeed. You, when you talk to Some people of that. in the yeah. Northwest, they're pretty clear that the violence was uh -huh. there, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. No. Hidden in the census data, right? You mean? Hidden in the. The violence was obscured by. Yes, yeah, yeah. Some of them was hidden, probably. I mean, this is and, not and a other was, uh, campaign uh, of enforced disappearances. No, right? no. This was, no. This was no. public acts yeah. of, uh -huh. of war. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But hidden violence is violence that has not been acknowledged, that, that has been completely written, left out of the narrative, written out of the narrative. But I mean, if you. Talk to people in the Northwest. I mean, they talk about during the counterinsurgency, soldiers going right door to door to, to try to root out kind of terrorists or terrorist elements, right? All the vocabulary at the time. You can mm -hmm. label it how you want to. But I mean, it was very public forms of violence. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, Christian, I acknowledge, we acknowledge in the very beginning the work by the Porton, hidden, hidden violence. I'm trying to understand the difference. It's completely different. No, um, I mean, she says excess mortality too, and she's got the map to show where the mortality happened. I'm just trying to figure out how. You seem very, very but, clear but on that the fact we, there's a we, difference. We, we, we study excess male mortality. Right. From 94 to, well. So, so the gender balance piece is the difference. That's the exactly the difference. Okay. Thank you. Because that's where you can quantify exactly, well, f fairly precisely. And then you can make the, and then you can uh, work out the ethnic distribution. And there's also potentially more nuanced mechanisms going on in Luke's argument, right? So, yeah. so missing parts of the, of the Hutu population, I, I have to go back and read the Raputin uh -huh. article too, right? Yeah. I, don't, I don't remember exactly uh -huh. what she concludes. Um, but, but I read that more as, I think she's trying to draw conclusions about civil war deaths, right? So, no, she's, so try, she's trying to parse out the difference between what could be attributed to genocide, what could be attributed to civil war, what could be attributed to places that have both She's trying to figure out how the different forms of violence are leading you to have expectations of excess mortality rates in these different locations and how they overlap. Because some places experience both, some experience neither. Other but she works with absolute mortality figures. We work just with relative mortality figures. So what we can say with. Then help clear, what's the difference for me? How, what's the difference between the two? We, we just. Or we, our exercises, uh, figuring out how many more males than females died in, uh, or w went missing between 1991 and 2002. You have, because you, you have sex ratios that, that uh, 
of 78 and, and 1991, and they, okay, they change, they, the sex ratio um, is first almost the same, then boys, uh, baby boys, more baby boys die, and, and then, uh, it's, then it's 0 0.97, and then it, dec that it, then it declines, and then at, at the very end of the life spectrum, they are the same again, almost. For, um, so, you, you can, per, per age group, you can calculate how many there should have been with, if the normal sex ratio had applied for that age group in, um, in 1991. She does only um, look at the Northwest, only the uh, No? That's what she said in the abstract. Oh, okay. Really? Can I ask just a quick question on your low intensity conflict numbers? Are those the UCDP conflict numbers that you're using when you're talking about low intensity the number of people that are um, in the war? Okay, I, the, I quote a book, <coughs> and, and the book has the references to the primary sources, and which I also consulted, but I thought for, this, for, for, yeah. for, for, uh, for easy reference. So I don't know um, whose numbers um, or where the numbers come. But um, the University of Uppsala has a much lower figure. I, so I took the highest figure. Okay. 14,000 is the highest estimate for eight years of war, insurgency, counterinsurgency. Yeah, I think our estimate was a higher estimate. Because um, um, when we were calculating, um, when we were calculating battle-related casualty deaths, we separated from those that took place on the front, which we attributed directly to armed confrontation between the units, those that took place under the jurisdiction of the FAR, and those that took place under the jurisdiction of the RPF. And so I think our number was a little bit, was a little bit higher. But the thing that, what I find interesting though is um, um, the kind of demographic approach is looking at um, differencing sensei, um, and then they're kind of drawing some conclusions about what they think took place in between those sensei. For, for much of the conflict group that I come from, we're actually trying to get general estimations in between those sensei, relying upon government and NGO and satellite images and other types of stuff to generate those type of estimates. Um, but um, what's interesting for me is um, the degree to which they actually overlap in terms of what they're telling you, which you, you then end up being much more confident about. But I was wondering how you would respond, not to take um, Marie's position, but um, her Gakongoro piece, so she's got the one piece that kind of compares the population estimates that came from a source that's different from the census, differed from the census actually. She argued that the census estimates of, um, of uh, population were also different from these things. And I'm wondering if- Oh, that's the ethnic categorization, eh? There was an ethnic categorization, but there was, there, was also, there was also a difference with the terms of the, the overall population that was- Because it doesn't really matter. It of the overall population that was estimated. Well, uh, whether, the, Sorry, whether, whether, whether Tutsi were, um, for our calculation, whether Tutsi were, what, 8% or 10% of 12%, it doesn't matter. And about, the, okay, about military deaths, uh, uh, Christian said we, we, we have a higher number, but I'm, if you consider the, the two armies, 25,000 versus 30,000, you, you're not gonna have tens of thousands of military deaths. So 14,000 would, uh, would be probably one in four of the, of the combined forces of 60,000, right? So question, military deaths, you say um, perhaps higher, I'm not sure, if you, if the, the combined Forces of the two armies was what? 50, 60,000. So if 14,000 of them died in action, that's a high percentage. So you, what I'm saying is you're not going to have 30,000. Um, so other question concerned um, 
What's the error around your estimate? What is there? The error around your estimate. So like, um, give me some parameters, because okay. I'd say I think your number, I think your estimate is low. So I'm just like. Um, okay, we have been very conservative with everything. Okay. <laughs> because we know this will be scrutinized and scrutinized by, by the friends of Rwanda, and um, if we make a mistake there. So we were extremely happy to find to to find the the UNHCR uh, figures, not not the total number of because the, the, the absolute number of refugees is not that important. What matters is the sex ratio of that refugee population. That's what matters, and there we found UNHCR numbers. Whether there was 500,000 or 50,000 refugees abroad doesn't matter. It's a sex ratio. So the sex ratio, um, potential biases, I don't, I don't know as well as the ethnic ones, right? So I know of the biases that exist with regards to the sources concerning um, ethnicity, but from the demographic perspective in terms of the census, we're believing that there's just an equal probability. There's no bias that you would have. No question. Um, well, but but that but you're presuming the census got it right. So my question yes, is that, that, but yes, because they, um, you can follow a, a birth cohort in the different sense in the different in, in the four censuses. So, and it, it it's you get confirmation of that of that of the, the of the counting of the numbers in a birth cohort. No, that no, that that that's not you. I do that for my other paper in progress. Um, the other paper in progress is uh, titled, um, "Okay, how many died in the 1994 um, um, Rwandan genocide?" Double colon, uh, an examination of the official numbers. So, I, I don't scrutinize your numbers or anybody else's numbers. It's the official numbers and the methodology. That's what I do. And then the, the constitutionalization of that more than one million, and then the next step, the criminalization of more than one million. So, yeah. There's no. a question in the back as well. Sure. Yeah, it's a microphone. 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 Yeah, yeah. Thanks for this presentation. Um, so, as I understand it, the comparison you're making is if we assumed that the deaths during this time period were you know, ra a random draw between the genders, you, you, would, you would have an equal, uh, among the people that died during 1994 to 1998, if it was balanced, then you, you'd have like an equal number, and you see this gender indifference. I wonder if you can, I mean, in, in the future presentations, think about, I mean, two things, both visualizing it is sort of maybe a bar graph where you show that Yes, this is my first presentation. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that you might want to go to that because it could be helpful in, in visualizing both this imbalance but as well as maybe even extrapolating towards. So you, you have, we have estimates on the total number of deaths that occurred during this time period. Mm -hmm. And what you, what, you, what you pull out from this is there are more men presumably, that, that are missing. There's a, there's a male deficit. The, right. the, the authors of the report said, hey, the, the sex ratio goes down from, from 0 0.95 to 0 0.91. That's a big decline. Uh, I wonder if you can also estimate, though, um, how many total, uh, total deaths Imp by gender? Dur impossible. Okay. It's absolutely impossible. If, 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 if we could, that, if, if it was possible, then we could calculate the total death because the two genders together would, would give you the total number of, of casualties. But it's impossible. I mean, isn't this, this ratio difference? This stands completely, this is completely different from calculating total. But, but, but these, the 173, would be a, a portion of the overall deaths of course, during this period. Of course. And so at least 173,000. 
that, that, <laughs> that we know. And, and in the scenario that they were all men, okay. What he's asking is why can't you scale that up to total blood numbers? No, no, no. Here's how, how does this affect? Sorry, my only suggestion. The only uh, way to have uh, the only way to to have an, an uh, actual number that the casualty number for 1994 was if there had had there been a census, a good census, right after, which the offer was made. To the, to the RPF government, international agencies, UN, UN, UNDP, et cetera, with a lot of expertise in data gathering, population data gathering, offered. So the issue is that too much stuff has happened between 94 and That's it, that's it, that's it, absolutely. Because um, many women eh, and men in their uh, childbearing age were killed, so they didn't have children. So, um, whereas you can you can only calculate how many there would have been normally without war and genocide, given the given the demographic evolution of of uh, of uh, going uh, from from uh, ex from the highest uh, the highest annual growth rate in Africa, it was slowing in uh, after eighty seven. Uh, introduction of uh, uh, family planning programs. So we, we should have arrived in 2002 at, at about 10 million at a three, uh, without, without the mass return of the Tutsi diaspora. And there's only, with their return, there's only 8 million. So you could say 2.5 million people missing. Were they all killed? No. no. Uh, premature death because of the complete uh, collapse of the of the health infrastructure, etc. Children that were never born mm -hmm. because the parents uh, died were killed. A woman, a woman, a Hutu or Tutsi woman, in her twenties, thirties, she would have had between ninety four and two thousand two, she would have had maybe five children, right? So, could you use some of sorry. Um, Last question. So would it be possible to draw on some of the, again, different data collection, but the data collected in the cells during the information gathering phase? And I know there's all kinds of problems about that. But you, that's exactly where I want to go. OK. That's where, that's where you have the it's answer. It's more or less a census. It's yeah, and, yeah. But exactly, but it's a census not from 2002, but a census about what happened okay. somewhere okay. earlier. Okay which would get you then an, potentially an answer that might be imperfect, but it might get you into the ballpark. You could also use some surveys, because surveys do ask where people went. And then you can get some general sense of um, who, was out, who was still outside of the country. Some surveys ask um, how many of your friends or relatives are still out of the country. Because there's this other element of um, there's all these camps, and there's all this huge mass migration out, and been, been back migration. So 2002 is a. Is a, and then they're living in different locations, right? So 2002 is, represents a very mm -hmm. massive shift of mm -hmm. the population. So to see any similarity whatsoever in, in sex ratios is kind of um, intriguing given that, right? Um, but there's a guy, um, there was a guy at um, IPUMS who, who does a similar type of differencing. Um, he's like, uh, he generated the estimate of kind of like what the, what effect the Mexican Revolution had on the population um, estimation growth, and that's a whole literature that kind of concerns um, excess mortality is a very different group than the group that's engaging in casualty um, battle casualties uh -huh. and so forth. Uh -huh. But uh -huh. they should be overlapping, yeah. and the, the, they should be tapping similar types of populations. But that's cool. But let us stop so um, we get some food, and we reconvene at one thirty. One thirty. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Mm -hmm.